Salam Allah. Salam Alaikum. Shalom. Peace, peace, peace to the streets. I'm your brother in the struggle, brother Minister Ali. And today we're going to decipher the cipher how the FBI divided Malcolm from his messenger. Now, to understand the complexities of this devil's trick knowledge, the first thing we have to make clear is this. Malcolm X was loved by messenger Elijah Muhammad. Malcolm X loved messenger Elijah Muhammad. The messenger warned all of his followers that one of the tricks of Dr. Yaqub Malik Shabazz, according to the Supreme Law God who came in the person of the Master Father, Muhammad Tumar, praise his due forever, was the law, an ancient law, over 6,000 year old law, to divide and conquer the believer against the believer, the black nation against itself. And once you have them arguing, fighting, and even killing each other, then you can come in and rule both sides. This is exactly what took place with the assassination of Malcolm X. Now, a lot of the trickology of the devil, you got to understand it's tricks and knowledge. So the way they do it is, is real diabolical. You know what I mean? And the reason why it's relevant is because they still use the same trickology to this very day worldwide amongst the original people. You know what I mean? Just about within the last six years, they divided the conscious community against itself. The conscious community that used to be teaching and elevating the consciousness of the mentally dead started arguing and fighting and wanting to kill each other. While the devil was hiding in the background. Now, I mean, we have to stop letting COINTELPRO or the counterintelligence program of that devil, J. Edgar Hoover, keep neutralizing the rise of our people's consciousness. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad explained to us, first of all, that he was not worrying about the FBI. He, he knew that the nation's line was what he called in Mess of the Black Man, honeycomb with stool pigeons or rats or spies or what have you. Now, I mean, he understood that, you know, during slavery, the slave master would condition some of the slaves to sell that soul for a piece of fried chicken and a biscuit with a little butter on it. Now, I mean, just to ease some of the hardship and those of you that been in the belly of the beast know that that's how they that's how they do in county jails, state jails, and federal prisons all over the world. Now I mean, you know, it's like um, if a person wants to get closer to their family, they'll sell you out, not because they necessarily hate you, but they miss that daughter, they miss that son, they miss that wife, and they use that natural bond, that natural affection, that natural love to get them to help them capture the slaves, help them maintain the slaves. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he says this right here to the FBI. He makes something clear to the FBI regarding this. He says to us, and I'm going to show you where I'm coming from. This is Message to the Black Man in America, 1965, page number 235. Okay. This is page number 235 of the Message of the Black Men in America. The messenger explained basically that he wasn't worried about the FBI spying on the nation of Islam or getting people to rat or snitch on him. Now, I mean, his thing was like he wanted them to know what he's teaching, as we shall see later on. The messenger said, all of my followers have been questioned by the FBI. Just what are you trying to do? You want to find out just how weak or how strong we are. We want the FBI to know what we are teaching. We are not teaching what we do not want you to know, FBI. We want the government to know we have no secrets. The thing that you should do is to keep it a secret yourself when you can. 
So here the messenger makes it clear that, you know what I mean, that was that was not his knee or his intent. You know what I mean? He understood just like um when you read the Old Testament, there's spies in Nineveh. There you you read the um the gospels of Jesus, there's spies. When you read the history of uh Prophet Muhammad, he had to deal with lip professors and hypocrites in his ranks. You know what I mean? So that's not new to those that sacrifice and struggle for freedom, justice, and equality. That, that basically comes with the territory. You know what I mean? Now, in Message to the Black Man in America, the messenger gives us this outline about his trials and tribulations on page 178. He said, usually I do not waste my time on the untrue things that I hear or read about me and my followers, stated by our open enemies, the white people, and those of my people whom they have poisoned against self and their kind, the black race. It is written in the scriptures of truth that the devils would put out such evil and false accusations against the messenger of the law and his followers in these last days of that evil, bloody world. I think a law God will not allow falsehood to triumph over truth in his days. This so-called fact-finding committee on page 131 says that my father took me to Detroit where I attended the public schools until reaching the third grade, at which point I left home at the age of 16 and wandered from city to city serving various jail terms for vagrancy and other minor offenses except for a term of four years in a federal penitentiary. The message explained that the FBI on May 8th, 1942 in Washington, D.C. came and arrested him. Now, he made this statement on September the 20th of 1942 to the FBI. He explained his history because the FBI and Bossy and state agencies and county agencies, they was basically trying to make it like the nation of Islam was a voodoo cult that they believed in self um, sacrificing rituals and just all kind of spooky nonsense. The devil just being the devil, trying to scare our people away from Islam. You know what I mean? The messenger himself explained. I was born in Sanderville, Georgia in the year 1897. I have never known the exact day or month of my birth because my mother was not able to remember it. Now, you hear in this day and time, a lot of people say that Ambalaja Mama was born October the 7th. Uh, basically, what basically happened decades after the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, they found the Sandersville, Georgia census. Now, the messenger was born in Sandersville, Georgia. So they found a census where his mother in her own handwriting had to sign in the stuff. And she basically had his name, Elijah, spelled E-L-I-J-A. And the slave master's names was Poole, P-O-O-L. And after slavery, to separate the black pools from the white pools, they added an E to their last name. So it became P-O-O-L-E. Okay. So he was born Elijah Poole. And according to her handwriting, he was born on October the 7th of 1897. So that's why you find a lot of historians and people say that particular year. He explained, my grandparents worked as slaves for a white family by the name of Poole near Sandersville, Georgia. And in my early life, I was known as Elijah Poole. I attended school at Cordell, Georgia, but went only through the fourth grade. After leaving school, I worked on my father's farm until 1919. In 1919, I was married to Clara Evans at Cordell, Georgia. From 1919 to 1923, I worked for the Georgia and Southern Railroad at Macon, Georgia. In 1923, my wife and our two children went to Detroit, Michigan, and from that year on to 1929, I worked for various companies in that city, including the Detroit Copper Company, the American Nut Company, 
Briggs Body and the Chevrolet Axle Company. In the latter part of 1929, due to the depression, I was out of work, but remained in Detroit. Around the year 1930, while in Detroit, I heard of a religion called Islam, which was being taught by a, name, by a man named A. Wallace Fard Muhammad, who is a law. A law conducted meetings at various halls in Detroit from 1930 to May of 1933, and usually had about 700 or 800 persons at these meetings. These meetings were held at various halls in the city of Detroit, the last of them being located at 3408 Hastings Street. The capacity of this hall was about 400 people, so there were two meetings held to accommodate the overflow. I attended one of these meetings sometime in the year 1931, and the law was present and toured his religion, which was called Islam. Shortly after this, a law came to my house almost daily and taught me about Islam and then continued coming to my home less frequently for a period of 15 months thereafter until May 26, 1933, when the Detroit Police Department forced him to leave the city. I remained in Detroit and continued teaching Islam at various meetings from 1933 to September of 1934 when because of pressure from the Detroit Police Department, I left the city and came to Chicago. The last time I saw a law was in Chicago in 1934, and I do not know where he is at present. When the law first came to my home in Detroit in 1931, he said that he was my D and that he was a law who everyone expected to come 2,000 years after the Christ who was crucified at Jerusalem. At this time, Allah gave me the name Mohammed. He, the messenger spelled Mohammed M-O-H-A-M-E-E-D at that time, which I have used ever since. From 1929 to the present, I have had no regular job of any kind. Occasionally, I would do odd jobs for one day or so during this period. However, for the most part, for the last 11 years, my family and myself have been taken care of financially by the Muslims. From 1931 to 1935, I taught Islam in Detroit and Chicago. From 1935 to the present, I have traveled extensively and have lived for various periods in the following cities, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., Boston, Providence, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Columbus, Dayton, Cincinnati, and Atlanta. During this time, my family remained in Chicago, and they and myself were supported by voluntary contributions from the Muslims. The monies which I received all came from the members of the Muslim temple in Chicago. During the time I have traveled about, I engaged in no activities other than the study of religion and I was also endeavoring to avoid unknown individuals who I understand were trying to take my life. I also visited Muslim temples in Philadelphia, Newark, Hartford, Columbus, Baltimore, and Washington, D.C. It is my understanding that there are more than 25,000 Muslims over the United States and about 400 or 500 in the city of Chicago. Let me cover the, the, the last part. In order to clarify Islam and its teachings, I desire to set out the following information. Principles. Number one, belief in the law. Number two, belief in the prophets. Number three, belief in the scriptures that the prophets bring. A, the Bible. B, the Holy Quran. Four, prayer. Five, charity. The purpose of Islam is the cleanup of the dark people physically and spiritually so they will be respected by the other civilized people of the earth. In their present condition, they are not and cannot be honored and respected by intelligent people. Islam desires to eliminate prostitution, gambling, and drinking among the dark people so they can be respected. All dark people are Muslims, whether they realize it 
or not. A law came to teach Islam and take away our slave names and give us free names of the nation of Islam. Prior to 1935, at the time the free names was given, a law issued to the Muslims a card which he must carry with him and which identified him as a righteous Muslim. There were approximately 35,000 of these cards issued by law, and although numerous applications have been made for such cards since 1934, no additional cards have been issued because the law is the only one who can issue them. All Muslims who have applied for their registration cards but have not received same are referred to by their first names plus the letter X or double X or triple X. In connection with this matter of registration, I desire to state that I have not registered under the Selective Service Act of 1940 as amended. I realize that failure by me to register constitutes a violation of federal law, but the reason I did not register is that in 1931, a law told me I was registered as a Muslim and belonged to him. At this time, a law also told me that he did not want me to associate in any way with fighting or military service. A law has told all Muslims that they should remain righteous and not engage in fighting or military service of any kind. A law has taught that a Muslim should take no part in military service or fighting or anything pertaining thereto. I teach Islam according to what I have been told by a law. A law gave to all of us registered Muslim names, this teaching himself when he gave out the identification, identification cards with our holy name on that you will not take any part in fighting or anything pertaining to fighting. This also applied to prostitution and all kinds of gambling. I have reminded the registered Muslims of the instructions of a law that they should do no fighting or take part in it, that they should live clean lives and in peace. The registered Muslims already have been taught this by a law. A law has taught that blueprints of a plane which carry bombs was given to the Japanese from the holy city of Mecca and that these blueprints had been there for thousands of years. These bombs would go into the earth for at least a mile and would throw up earth to a distance of one mile so that it would make a mountain. I have remained the registered Muslims. I have reminded the registered Muslims of this teaching. A law also taught that all dark people are Asiatics and belong to one nation. A law also taught that white people were grafted from the dark people and that white people were made weak and wicked. He taught that registered Muslims would be persecuted for their righteousness and that white people were created to live 6,000 years and that time was up in the year 1914 AD. He further taught that the dark people will have peace when the troublemaker, that is the devils or white man, is separated from the peaceful. As a loyal follower of Islam and a registered Muslim, I subscribe and believe in all of the above teachings. And I have also taught these principles to other Muslims. I have been living in Chicago permanently since the early part of July. 1942, or shortly after I was released on bond at Washington, D.C. Since I have been here, I have spoken on about eight or nine occasions at meetings of the Muslims at the temple located at 104 East 51st Street on the third floor, Chicago, Illinois. At these meetings which I spoke, I discussed the teachings of Allah. I estimate that there were about 150 to 300 people at these meetings. I have read the foregoing statement and facts related herein, and they are all true. Now, this is the footnote that the devil put here. Elijah Muhammad admits the truth of this statement, but refuses to sign, stating that his word is his bond, 
and his signature is not necessary. He intends to admit the truth of this statement in court, witnessed by three FBI agents. So here, the messenger explained that what he was teaching, he was not trying to hide it from the FBI. He wanted the FBI to know what he was teaching about the mother plane, about Master Muhammad, about the white man being the devil, about the black man being God, you name the holy names, whatever, all the teachings. You know what I mean? He was and is and shall be forever through his teachings, the first, last, and only messenger of the Supreme Law God who came in the person of Masafar Muhammad, to whom all praises are due forever. The Holy Quran teaches us in chapter 20, verse 102. Do you think that you will be left alone on saying that you believe and that you will not be tested? And indeed, we, the 24 scientists, tested or tried those before you, and we will test those after you. So we will know the ones who are truthful, and we will know the liars. Trials purify. The message teaches us that the persecution of the Muslims just go along with you being an FOI or an MGT. We're taught to fear no one and no thing but Allah who came to personal master for Muhammad, to whom all praises due forever. Let's turn to page 215 of Message to the Black Man. From Message to the Black Man, 215. The messenger goes on to say about the right the peaceful assembly denied the so-called American Negroes, meaning we don't get constitutional rights in the devil's system. You have to understand that. The messenger says, Dear brothers in the nation of Islam, and especially my people here in America, we live the worst enemies of Islam and of the peace of the world. It should now be clear to you after the attacks that have been made upon us and are still being made by the brutal American police forces with FBI harassment and persecution, that the law has manifested the white race of America to be nothing but a race of devils. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad explained to us on November the 23rd in 1961. This is unpublished and rare writings of Messenger Elijah Muhammad. November the 23rd, 1961. He wrote, America's persecution, the Muslims, what will be her end? This is part two. This is how he goes into the FBI. We, the Muslims, are persecuted from city to city and from state to state at the hands of the universal enemies of the black nation of Islam and the black man's period, the white race. For 30 long years, the government of America has been sending us in groups and by the hundreds to state and federal penitentiaries throughout the United States of America under false charges and false excuses. The persecution of the Muslims was taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to all FOIs and MGT, including his national representative, Malcolm X. When you hear the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's grievances and dissatisfaction and opposition against Malcolm, it is not against Malcolm X. It's against Malcolm, meaning that once he sided with Satan, once he believed in Yaku's technology, once he refused to heed the messenger's warnings, when he came from the belly of the beast, the messenger warned him about Job having that hedge of protection removed from around him. He, he explained to him that he can't use bloodbath teachings. You can't, you can't, you cannot 
underestimate the devil. You cannot underestimate or doubt the power of Satan. Here is a man, realistically, practically, pragmatically, that if you're in Harlem, New York, and you're teaching and training unarmed FOIs, they may have some martial arts skills, they may have some boxing skills, they may be disciplined, they may even have arms to protect their family with, and of course with the Second Amendment of the state and U.S. constitutions, what have you. But they're not manufacturing these weapons. They're not guerrilla fighters. That, that is not the way of a law, according to the life-giving teachers of Al-Balaj Muhammad, because he understands what type of stratagem, what type of chess moves he's going to have to make to guide our people through this age of mess. It's only the messenger's message that's going to guide us through this age of mess. We're not going to get there by selling keys of coke, by arming ourselves with assault rifles and a few brick backs and a few homemade bombs and thinking that we're going to do some guerrilla fighting and all. It's like, no, 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 that's not, that's not wise. That's not Hakeem. That's not wisdom. That's foolish. You know what I mean? Here's a man that before the event of modern technology, when he was using old fashioned technology, you know what I mean? He was able to equip his planes with atomic bombs and drop them on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Look at the effect that had. Now imagine that bomb dropping on Harlem, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, D.C. Now, I mean, imagine that dropping on Atlanta. Imagine our people realistically at war with the city police, the state police, the National Guards, the, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, the nuclear bombs at the bottom of the oceans and submarine nuclear submarines now i mean the the jets the the black hawks the stealth bombers the tanks now i mean the uh missiles coming from outer space now i mean do we realistically think that that would be something we want our children and women to be up against of course, as men, we do whatever we have to do to defend ourselves. Now, I mean, if we had to, if we if all we had was a toothpick to defend ourselves, we're going to war with that toothpick because we fear no one but the law. Now, I mean, if if we had if we had to just uh, throw a rock, we'll throw a rock. But a Muslim is never the aggressor. A Muslim uses good judgment and discretion. A Muslim has to obey a law and his messenger and believe that it's only the messenger's message that will guide us through this age of mess. COINTELPRO forces kept using technology on our beloved, very intelligent, very, very disciplined, very, very obedient and beloved spokesman, Malcolm X. But the politics, you know what I mean? And I don't want to make it like Malcolm was just, just some hypocrite or some lip professor or some enemy of the nation of Islam. Malcolm loved the nation of Islam. He loved the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He loved Muhammad Ali. He loved Minister Farrakhan. He loved the FY. He loved him. He would have gave his life for this nation. But he would have ran in front of some bullets to protect the lowest believer, you or me. No doubt in my mind whatsoever. You know what I mean? So it's painful when a man is going through prophecy. Now I mean, it's painful when the messenger was trying to make the teaching so plain that a fool would not err. Now I mean, he explained in his first book that hopefully we would understand it that we could break the old prophet's predictions. Now, I mean, meaning he understood that that which was written inside the Bible, the Quran, it just simply just is going to come to pass. How and exactly he didn't know, we didn't know, you don't know, but, but we don't have to cross the T's and dot the I's, but we see human nature repeating itself over and over again. The student and the leader conflict. Now, I mean, we see, we see that with Moses and Korah. 
Now I mean, Korah was one renowned in the temple. He was the best speaker in the temple of Moses' Faust. He was he was that boy, but he fell. Judas was sitting right there at the table with Jesus. He loved Jesus, but you have doubt in Thomas's. You had that Judas element. Not that he really, he definitely didn't hate Jesus. He definitely didn't want to betray Jesus initially. It was more like the politics. He's like, he wanted, he wanted justice. He wanted what Jesus wanted more than what, then Jesus wanted it for himself. But his thing was, he was hasty. He was young. Malcolm, you gotta understand, Malcolm was a young man. Fiery, you know what I mean? When you young, you, you know, you're full of that fire. You like, man, bring the noise. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's it's like I, I I understand that heart. You know what I mean? When you when you when you love something and you you be like, man, I'm tired of this, man. You know what I mean? It's like it could be five guards in front of your cell. You 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 a buck fifty soaking wet. These jokers like two, three hundred pounds. They got shields, helmets, big clubs, this, that, and the other pepper spray. Well, they like, come on now. F you to bring your bring the noise. <laughs> yeah, that's that was fun. Now I mean, because as a man, as that that warrior in you, you you like, man, I wanna fight. <laughs> I mean, and you need your old heads. You need you don't want to hear from no cowards, but you need people that can think. Like, yo, I don't give I mean, it's like, look, I mean, at the end of the day, the same man you just attacked, the same man you spit on, the same man you just cursed out, the same man you just kicked, the same man you tried to stab, when they come to your cell two hours, two days later, and bring you your food, you got to eat out their hands or you got to starve to death. Now, some brothers used to literally go on hunger strikes. But our thing was like, nah. Now, nah, I mean, we ain't doing that kind of stuff. Now, nah, I mean, you know, we we, 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 we participate that sometimes as a show of force and unity. And it's like, man, we'd rather have our strength so we could go to war with these jokers. We want to, we, we die, we're going to die on our feet. So I understand not just Malcolm. Malcolm don't, is not one person. Malcolm represents a lot of people in and out of the nation of Islam. He represents that fiery spirit, that that fearless youth, that fearless warrior, that 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 that, that black man that's just sick and tired of being sick and tired. So you are gonna say some things you don't supposed to say. We all do that. Now I mean, you are gonna do some things you don't supposed to do. Now I mean, but that don't mean that he didn't love the messenger. But he didn't understand how vicious and how strategic and how organized and how wealthy and connected this octopus with all these tentacles was all over the place. Now, I mean, so he's thinking he's talking on the phone and they spy and listening. I mean, they got bugs all over the place. When they come see him, he put the tape on in his house because he know these devils come to see him. And he he wasn't with telling and all that. But in the political entry, J. Edgar Hoover and, them, J. and, 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 and his assistants, they, they, they came with this technology, which caused a lot of the FOIs to get upset with Malcolm. Now you got dissension in the ranks. This is Malcolm X by Dulaney Davis, the great photographs. Now he explains in here on page 163 what it was that, in my opinion, from the people I personally spoke to that, that was actually soldiering in the 1960s, people I one-on-one -on -one talked to. And they explained basically like it was January the 29th, 1965. That was the straw that broke the camel's back with certain brothers. Th these brothers was like, they didn't care what the messenger was saying, Minister Farrakhan or any minister was saying. These street dudes, all right? So basically that thing was January 29th, 1965. Malcolm X testifies before the Illinois Attorney General concerning the nation of Islam. Now, that, let me 
because I think it's hold up. Because COINTELPRO is vicious. All right. Now, alkalimat.org wrote a lot of books, if you will. And he gives you the chronology. And the reason why this always stuck in my head is because January 29th, 1965, when Malcolm reported he testified before the Chicago Attorney General against the, the messenger in the nation of Islam, I was physically coming into the world. January 29th, I was being born in the back of a taxi cab from my mother, Rosa Parks, at the time. Not the Rosa Parks was on a bus, but Rosa Parks that's from Georgia, too. You know what I mean? My, my, my family is from um, North Philadelphia at the time of my birth, but my mother and them, they, they came from down south. They migrated from Macon, from down, um, Macon Georgia into Phil North Philadelphia. But on January the 26th, 1965, Malcolm reportedly spoke at Dartmouth College Radio WDCR interview in Hanover, New, New Hampshire. Then on the January the 28th, he did another radio interview with Harry Ring on WBAI in New York. Then he flies to Los Angeles and meets with attorney Gladys Tolls Root and two former Nation of Islam secretaries who are filing paternity suits against Elijah Muhammad. Then on January the 29th, 1965, he testifies before Illinois' attorney general who is investigating the Nation of Islam activities. So here you got COINTELPRO looking to set up the messenger and the same COINTELPRO looking to set up, set up Malcolm X. Here you have the FBI setting up the slander of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and here you have the FBI setting up the slander of Malcolm so that they can start fighting and arguing, killing each other. And like Yakub's law, they come in as the peacemaker. We have to understand that the devil and his imps, that's what Muhammad called his imps, impersonators, are going to always try to weaken, disrupt, neutralize, misdirect, confuse, and destroy not just the nation of Islam. They did this with the Black Panthers. They did, they did this with even Dr. Martin Luther King. I mean, you know, they did this with Marcus Messiah Garvey. They did this with Nat Turner, Denmark Vesey, Harris. This is the devils being the devil. This is how they did our people in Africa. This is how they did the Arabs. This is how they did the Chinese. This is how they did the Indians, the Native Americans, the, Austral the Aboriginal Australians. This is how they did the Jamaicans, the Cubans. Divide and conquer is how the 1% is able to neutralize the masses by keeping us fighting and arguing and killing each other <laughs> and choosing sides. I'm Democrat. I'm Republican. I'm for abortion. I'm against abortion. I'm for the death penalty. I'm against the death penalty. I'm against racism. I'm for the revolution. And, all, and the whole time, we're all suffering from the same evil effects of trichnology. And it's so complicated that some of our worst devils are black and some of our best friends are white. So we have to think in our mind, oh, the messenger message is so fine-tuned for us. His thing is like, our savers arrived, 1974, a few White people are Muslims by faith, no, though not by nature. He wrote a whole chapter on it. Like, listen, I'm not teaching race hatred. <laughs> I mean, it's just that some people hate the truth. You know what I mean? This thing is like, um, I'm not saying that the cultural teachings of the Bible is a lie. I'm saying that 
the interpretation of this white Jesus and the Ku Klux Klan burning cross, we're saying that the devil's technology, he uses good and evil, truth and righteousness, facts and fantasies to confuse you. Our lessons ask, can the devil fool a Muslim? Master Far Muhammad said, not nowadays. The struggle continues, family. One love. Peace to the streets.